Hi everybody, welcome to our bonus episode for February. Here's a few things to keep you going until we get back for our March episode. When I first started birding, I didn't know the difference between a currawong and a magpie. And I think nobody believed me, but it was really true. They were just both black and white birds. And so we want to talk a little bit about currawongs and magpies, the differences between them and some of their habits and things like that. So first of all, we'll have a go at clearly describing the two so that when people come across a black and white bird, they'll know the difference. Lou's turning her head away, so I think she's not up for describing. Do you want to? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. I think it actually, very common, commonly people don't know the difference between Thank currawongs you. and magpies. It's not big, no big deal. <laughs> I mean, you know, not everyone's a birder. <laughs> but there are a couple of small things that I think are worth looking at when you're visually to tell the difference. There's, there's a whole different lifestyle as well. They mm. both live completely different lifestyles, but... Just going to the visual appearance, I think the Korowong's bill and the magpie's bill are co- actually completely different mm. if you look at them mm. carefully. Mm. You'll see that the magpie's bill is straight and it's white mm. with a black tip, mm. sort of arrow shape, even on either side, whereas a Korowong has a very large black and sickle-shaped heavy-duty mm. bill yeah, it's a horrifying bill, really. It's pretty scary bill. Yeah. And it does some pretty scary things. Mm. So that is one way that I think is really worth considering, never mind the fact that they're both black and white. Mm. But also the eye. The eye in the adult magpie is brown. Mm-hmm. And the eye in the currawong is yellow. Yes, that's right. And the thing that I pick, first of all, is that In our area, the magpies have a white patch on their nape, the back of their neck. That, to me, that's really the most obvious difference between the two. Right, right. That's the way you look. Okay, so, but check with the bill and Mm. check with the eyes Mm. because they really will give you a very good clue. And in fact, magpies are pretty much sort of black and white. Um, Yes, you know, I mean, they vary in their patchiness, but they always have that white on the neck. Yeah. The Korowangs are pretty much black, mm. but they have white on the wings, on the inside of the wings, uh, the, the front wings, mm. whatever they call those four wings. There's a fancy name for them. And also under the under Just the under tail, the bum. Yeah. They're white, but mostly they're black. Mm. So they're a lot more black. That's in, right. Aren't they? Yeah. So I, we've probably done enough on that. <laughs> okay. So, so life, are, lifestyle. Do we like Korowangs? Oh, I like almost every animal, so I'm not going to give corongs a bad rap. I think they're smart birds. Everybody loves magpies, of course, because they're cute. Yes. Yes, they, they sort of think Except they're cute. Except for people Except who... they're not cute. Have you ever seen them just sitting on top of another magpie and screaming at them and pummeling? They fight. I think magpies that's... Fight. No, no, that's just play. Hmm. I don't know. (laughs) I think it's territorial sometimes. It's time to go, boys. You know, you've been around Mm, too long. Get your own territory. Yeah, could be. But the Korowong is a much more, well, it's a more vicious animal, really, I suppose. Yes, yeah. More carnivorous. Well, they're both carnivorous, let's face it. Yeah, but more so. But he's got that evil eye and he's a forest bird, really. Yeah. So Um, I love their call, the Korowong. But I don't like encouraging them into my garden because, as you will have all picked up, I'm very keen about having small birds in my garden. Mm. And the currawongs, I have seen the currawongs patrolling along the hedges, checking out who's nesting in there, treating it as a smorgasbord. And it really gives me the horrors. I'm reading from BirdLife Australia. Karawongs are voracious nest predators who may kill about 40 broods, up to two kilograms of small birds, to raise one brood of their own. They will also take healthy adult birds up to the size of a crested pigeon. So I'm not wanting to encourage them into my garden. However, magpies... (laughs) 
Well, go on. Yeah, well, I think this kind of value judgment's a bit mm, <laughs> dodgy, really. I mean, this is nature we're talking about here. So uh, you could just say that Karawangs are, they're smart, they are curious, they are predatory, mm. but their their lifestyle requires them that that's how they need to live. That's true, but I think that their numbers are increasing in urban areas. And so the more we develop areas, the better off the Karawongs are and Mm. the less so the smaller birds. So humans, can you please stop developing areas? Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Karawongs are just taking advantage of us. That's right, that's right. So the the thing is that Karawongs also, they say, they used to migrate a lot. Yes. Up and down uh, to the mountains and down to the coast. Mm. But nowadays they don't migrate so much because everyone's planting these berries. Yes. Like um, Cotoniaster, Cotoniasters, privets, hawthorns, privets, very big. A lot yeah. of birds are taking privet, privet fruits. Yeah. So if you don't want corowongs in your garden, don't. Have you got any fruiting? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> fruiting trees or We bushes? are surrounded by hedges, which in general I love, but which sometimes put out seeds. And I see the Karawangs picking through them. I don't know what the hedges are, but they do produce seeds. And that actually brings about a further comment about Karawangs and many other birds that eat berries. They eat the berry and they take it uh, as a seed and drop that seed in the bush and so lots of these introduced plants that we're discussing cotoniasters privets etc are being distributed throughout the bush and therefore creating more foodstuffs for karawongs and so on and, and so the cycle goes so we don't really want to encourage people to put in introduced berry producing plants would you say Lou? I would definitely say uh, and and it is a problem in the highlands because it's one of the things that we seem to really plant a lot of yeah we we do it for 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 visual reasons we don't think about the consequences of and it's not just currawongs there's quite a lot of um, pigeons and things that eat eat exotic fruits from our garden and poop it out in the bush that's right. So um, I have basically cut down my Ketoniaster. So I just found out the other day, and I think I'm the last person in the entire country to find this out, that the garden snails that we have in our gardens are not native gar- uh, snails. Lou. She certainly is the last. <laughs> I <laughs> thought everybody knew that. Well, it's been the world's <laughs> best kept secret. I didn't know. And thank you to our friend Linda who told me this. <laughs> and goodness knows what else there is out there that I don't know about. So these are the things that I've learned about uh, the garden snails that you have in our garden or and also about our native snails. Our any snail that you find in our garden, in your own garden, is very, very unlikely to be a native snail. They don't like the kind of gardens that we've created at all. You might might find one or two, but invariably they're going to apparently be garden snails. The garden snails like, you know, veggies and many of the introduced plants that we have. They love strawberries. Do they? Yeah, well, they, yes. they love just about everything, don't they? Yes, they Whereas do. native snails are more inclined to like going through leaf litter and composting things and that kind of stuff. And apparently some native snails are, um, oh, what's carnivorous and will actually eat garden snails. Ooh. Yeah, I read I that. I just had a bad thought. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> So, from now on, I'm going to be even more anti-garden snail than I perhaps would have been. So, uh, some things that you can do to discourage garden snails in your garden. Lou's making faces. She's got a bit, little bit nervous at this I point. I am a bit nervous. <laughs> you can put out a, a series of pots into your garden that are upturned with just a little opening and 
during the night or as morning approaches, the snails will make their way into the pots and you'll be able to collect them there and make them more easily being dis- to be disposed, make them easier to dispose of. How will you dispose of them? I reckon I would put them in a bucket of water. Drown them? Yeah. Right. You could squish them. I'm willing to do that now that I've learnt that I they're not them. native snails. I squish them okay. immediately, so fast that fast. they never know. Right. They never know when they were living or when they were dead. Okay, we'll do it that way. That, that, yeah, I like, I like that way myself. I know someone who cuts them up. Oh. Yes. Cuts them up. Yeah, actually with a pair of scissors. It's a disgusting thing to do. Oh. But mm, I don't know why I'm being me. so moralistic. <laughs> 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 I just think... You know. One or two other facts that I learned about introduced snails versus native snails. Uh, the introduced garden snails have four antennae and native snails have two antennae. And you probably knew this, but I never did, that... Their eyes are on the end of the antennae, which I guess if you ever looked in any children's book, you would know that, but it's never really sort of struck me. And snails can invert their antennae with the eyes on the end, like you would pull the rubber glove off, glove off and pull it inside out so that their eyes are protected within that antenna. They also, I was wondering... When they're little, they're just tiny weeny snails, do they shed their uh, shell or does their shell grow? How on earth does this happen? And do you know the answer to that? No. Have you ever thought about it? Yeah, no. (laughs) (laughs) What all snails do, well, uh, land snails do, is they lay down a kind of calciferous substance at the leading edge of their shell so that as they get older, the shell grows with them just by the outside leading edge always being increased. So as you look at the shell of the snail kind of from the side, the inner portion of the coil is its early shell when it was ah. little and it's just built up wow, I around didn't, and I around didn't know and around. That. Right. <laughs> I really love it if That's I could so tell clever. Lou something because she knows so much. Oh, I don't yes. know much. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yes. I didn't so know that, go. but it makes perfect sense. So does that mean that when you've got a big snail, he's old? He's an old bloke, yeah, which probably means I think they get to one – the average age for a garden snail is about one year, I think. Is that all? Yeah, yeah, and less in your garden and mine in future. And snails that have got shells that have got kind of a slight point on them, if you put them sideways and the, the pointy bit kind of comes up toward you, then the coil will invariably be going clockwise. Oh, is this like the bathroom plug thing? <laughs> Yeah, maybe in the – I don't know. We'll have to go north. And <laughs> I'm just wondering, see. in the north, yeah, in the northern hemisphere, do you think do it's the other way round? We'll have to do more reading on that. <laughs> <laughs> now, Lou doesn't like me talking about this since she's gone to the subject that she thinks no one else wants her to talk about. And that is snail bait for snails. I personally discourage the use of snail bait – There are some products that are allegedly safe for snails, but there is a great deal of material that indicates that they're not safe. So I personally am not going to take the risk. The point being that other animals will eat dead snails and they will not do well from a poisoned snail. So that's just my personal opinion. Mm. Uh, But until... There is no longer material around saying even safe snail baits are un- unsafe. I'm not going to use snail baits. Well, the problem, we, what we're really worried about more than anything is the blue tongues, yes. isn't it? Yes, yeah. Right. But also, like, birds eat yeah, snails. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. And apparently some native snails eat garden snails, so, mm. Mm. yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of a conundrum at the moment. Mm. I mean, like... I, I thought it was fine and then I was 
I, I, I was told by someone who I really trust that it wasn't fine. Mm. And I've since heard it definitely isn't fine. Mm. So, so now I'm leaning that way. It seems to us that it's just a risk that we are not willing to take. No, that's right. We wanted to talk about minors. We talked about Bill Minors last time, and this time we're going to talk about noisy minors, and later on we'll talk about common minors. Well, I really wanted... I I am very aware that a lot of people don't know the difference between a noisy minor and a common minor, Mm -hmm. Um, and quite understandably in a way, because they're both called minors. Mm. and they're both middle-sized birds and they're both sort of brown. And they're both pretty common. And they're both pretty common. <laughs> so I thought that I might um, just give a few hints about how you can tell the difference. Um, to start with, the spelling's different. <laughs> <laughs> so ask them how they spell their name. <laughs> <laughs> so if they say, my name's a common minor and that's M-Y-N-A-H... <laughs> or a just a with no h, then um, you've got an exotic bird there, not a native bird, but one that has adapted very, very well to Australia and is on the move, on the move Mm. everywhere. Mm. Um, It actually comes from tropical um, Asia. It's a lovely chocolate and it's chocolate and... Dark chocolate colour. <laughs> you know, that's what I think of it. It is that dark chocolate and also sort of creamier white chocolate, um, um, milk chocolate. But both birds, confusingly, have uh, yellow bills. They also have a yellow little um, piece of um, yellow behind the eye. They both have that. And both of them, too, have yellow... Or orangey legs. Mm. So, you know, you have to look at the plumage, really, to tell the difference. So this lovely, sleek, tropical bird that has now become so common in Australia is is an exotic bird. And it is becoming quite a problem. Well, it's been a problem for quite a while. But then we have a native bird. The noisy miner is a more sort of... Um, brown speckledy job he's actually quite pale on the underside and darker brown on the other side but there's nothing sleek or or matte looking about a I noisy would say minor i'm going gray for the color of oh noisy yeah minor. gray yeah. grayish mm. light brown mm. definitely not milk no. and dark chocolate but as you say it still has that yellow mark against it it has the yellow eye. bill the yeah. yellow at the back of the eye and the legs, they're not exactly as yellow as the mm. tropical, common minor from the tropical area, but they are, uh, they're, they're, they're orangey coloured yeah. legs. Yeah. And both, both types like to hang out in big groups. They're both very social. Mm. They're both very, very chatty. Mm. They make a lot of noise. But it's perhaps the behaviour more than anything that distinguishes them. The common miner is a bird that almost prefers to walk and hop around than to fly. Mm. That's true. You see them on the ground quite a lot, don't you? They have adapted so well to humans. Mm. It's not funny. No, it's it's certainly not funny. (laughs) They they like uh, gas stations. They like car parks. They like everywhere, though. Everywhere (laughs) where there's lots of people and lots of human waste. Yes. Food. Yeah. They will pick up. They have adapted so well to us. And mm. it's really, it is us who have created them. The noisy miner, on the other hand, is actually a honey eater. Mm-hmm. It's a native honey eater. And it does eat nectar, which the comma miner doesn't. They both take insects. But the one that is a honey eater, because it's native, it basically is a nectar feeder. It has a brush tongue, a mm. little, um, it's like a mop inside the tongue and it takes nectar a lot. I have a number and they know exactly which flowers are in flower when and so on and so forth. And they fly a lot. They they are not so much ground birds. 
and they particularly fly from gum trees. They plane down in through open spaces to where they want to be. And that, again, is an adaptation now to human behavior because we have created these open spaces, but we've mm. left these gum trees all around our mm. gardens or, our, or wherever. Deep in the bush, you probably don't find see neither. Them. No, that's when we're out, we don't see either. We don't either. see them when they're deep but in the But there is a, a perfect example of what you're saying is Barrel Golf Club. If you walk along Lynx Road at the back of Barrel Golf Club, there's a, a big pack of noisy miners there who have just totally taken control of that area. And this is a problem with both of these types of miners and the reasons why people are concerned about them. And that is that both of them are communal bullies and they do not want anyone else in their space at all. So they're, they're inclined to drive out other birds and in the case of the common miners, they're just driving out native birds and they're becoming extremely dominant through Australia. And in fact, uh, some group has declared, you know, a worldwide study on pests has declared them one of the 100 top threats to the world or something. I have to get that. Blimey. Yeah. Well, I know one of the problems with them is that they love to nest in hollows. Mm, that's Unlike right. the noisy miners who mm. build a proper nest, mm. they'll go in a drain hole, a gutter pipe, but also, unfortunately, they've joined the legion of, of native birds that want to live in hollows. Mm. So, so they, they are often... They knock out the, they knock the native out the, birds. The native birds yeah. from their And I've read estate. that they'll actually go to nests and chuck out nestlings and then not even use the nest. So management. <laughs> Both of these types of birds, it would be good to discourage them. And you've probably worked it out for yourself from what we've just said. The Oh, Lou's shaking her head. She doesn't want to discourage noises, I'm thinking. I thought we were going to go here because I'm obviously right out of left field with no, all my go colleagues. On. Go for it. Go for it. Tell us what you think. Well, I'm very unpopular with all the birders I know. I don't know anyone who agrees with me, but I will make my case. My case is that they are the noisy miners. Yes, of course, they're bully birds. They're very aggressive and they get together in groups and they monster other birds and they monster cats which is not such a bad thing, <laughs> and they monster dogs and they will monster goannas and mm. all sorts of things like that. And but your echidna? Uh, and, and the echidna, yes, <laughs> anything, you know. But they have their uh, – I, I, I watch them and as an organic gardener, I have to admire them because they are such hard-working birds. They're not mm. slack, mm. you know. They, every day, they come into my garden and they work their way through everything. They work through the bark, they look under the bark, they look under the leaves for insects because they they take a lot of insects as well as nectar. They go to the spider webs, they take the spider webs and the spiders, they check out the drains. Mm. They take <laughs> all those other pesty things that eat my vegetables, they get them. They are so thorough. Oh, uh, right. They are really thorough. And the other thing that I think is impressive about them is how they can alert other animals to a predator, like most like raptors. Mm -hmm. They all get together and they start to make a certain sound, and I know that sound really well, and that's when I go looking to see what it's all about. And they all go together. So they are actually providing a service to all the little birds around, all the other ones that are all busy just doing nothing. <laughs> Nothing, <laughs> or maybe they are just <laughs> oblivious. These birds are not oblivious. They are mm, so alert. They alert. are on the ball. They are hardworking. I think we should admire them. Right. Okay. They build their so own nests. This is going to be how I approach this. I don't want common miners in my garden. And the things that I do to discourage them, and I have to admit that I haven't been 100% successful, is to do what Lou and I recommend so often, to have low, dense plantings so that little tiny birds can find a safe place away from them. The common miners really like the open spaces 
And as Lou said, they like rubbish around. So, you know, in the townships, really be careful not to leave food, leftover chips, any of that sort of stuff around to encourage common miners. And in your garden, do dense plantings. I imagine that dense plantings would mean that, which I know Lou's got in her garden, would mean that the noisies are not going to be in a position to take over, but they're going to come in and do their job and the other birds are still going to have opportunities to exist there as well. Does that seem fair, Lou? Well, yes, it does seem fair. But, I mean, yes, I just think, you know, we're... What is that word? Anthropomorphizing when we call noisy miners bully birds. I mean, they're just smart. They get together and, <laughs> and, and get a little gang together. Yeah. What's wrong with that? We do that. Right. <laughs> we might leave that subject there. <laughs> it's always controversial. <laughs> we thought we might have a little chat about the difference between moths and butterflies and specifically how that applies to you the cabbage moth, the white cabbage moth that we see. So most people in the Highlands will be familiar with the white cabbage moth. It's a little white butterfly thing that is known to hang around in people's gardens and in particular likes the the food from the brassica family, the cabbages and those kind of things. And we see it quite a lot. It's probably the most common butterfly in anybody's garden. We call it cabbage moth, but in fact, it is a butterfly. So some of the differences between moths and butterflies. A butterfly usually lands with its wings closed and a moth usually lands with its wings open, but not all the time. A butterfly usually flies during the day and a moth usually flies during the night, but not all the time. A moth is usually stockier than a butterfly, but not all the time. (laughs) This is exactly right. A butterfly is is in general prettier than a moth. Moths are usually dull, but not all the time. So, everybody, what about the antennae? Oh, the antennae. Okay, tell us about the antennae. Oh, well, the antennae on the moths is thread like on the females. Oh, and usually, but not all the time, (laughs) um, feathery on the males, whereas Mm. butterflies have antennae which are long and thread like, but They've got knobs on the on end. the ends. Yeah, that's right. But really, at the end of the day, everything I read that's authoritative says, "Look, there's really not much difference between a butterfly and, and a, a moth." moth. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're from the same because there family. are so many provisors, like you were saying. You know, yes, day flying, but there's day flying moths. moths. You know, yeah. I mean, um, there are really bright and beautiful moths. Mm. So the, and. And there are some pretty dull butterflies. And some pretty boring butterflies. Yeah. <laughs> not boring, not boring. Just, just boring. So <laughs> our white cabbage moth is a butterfly, everybody. We'll just describe it briefly because there are other white butterflies. It's a sort of small to medium butterfly. It's white. It's got black tips on the four wings. And underneath the wings, if you do ever see them close, it's, it's a, just a beautiful actual lemony yellow colour. And this is not a native butterfly, this one. No. I don't know whether it's – was it I think it came in with the vegetables, didn't it? Yes, I think so. I don't think it was deliberately introduced, although I understand that a number of predators have been introduced to try and reduce oh. its numbers. Well, they're not doing without... too much of a job, are they? No, Because uh, you don't just see them in gardens. I mean, you see them all over the bushes. You're driving around yep. down the streets. Yeah. They're everywhere. They're really a problem. Yeah. And a major problem to gardeners, unfortunately. Yes, because yeah. they lay their eggs in their cabbages. Mm. For mm. those who grow cabbages. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking you're not one of them. No. <laughs> All right, I hope you enjoyed that. We'll see you again in March. Bye. <laughs>